Thank you very much for that very warm uh, and very flattering, if I may so, say so, welcome. I, this is the first time I think I've actually stood at a podium since I, since I quit. Um, <laughs> so uh, what I can do, I think, is set aside some of the, the, uh, the devices that I have used over the last decade or so uh, to express my own views and express them rather more dire directly. Those of you who have ever worked in civil service will know what you do when, when you disagree with something you can't say you disagree with it, you find someone else who said they disagree with it and you quote them saying it and you say, you put it in the context of rich policy debate and all that kind of stuff. But I can leave that behind and I can say to you that absolutely in my opinion this coalition government is dangerous to the health of the population of this country. Um, in my view, it is systematically dismantling the structures of civil society. They seem to have a view that creating problems would generate space for innovative solutions. Uh, witness witness their, uh, their short-lived addiction to the notion of big society, that somehow creating lacunae in the provision of care and services right across our communities would enable those communities somehow to, to step up and fill that gap, completely ignoring, completely ignoring that uh, there are huge differences in the communities, huge difference in this, differences in this city of, of, of almost 10 years life experience, uh, of life expectancy between the best off ward and the worst off ward. Huge and huge differences in the, in the social capital in each and every one of those communities. It's been an interesting week, hasn't it, really, with uh, uh, the the reshuffle uh, playing out and uh, I, I've just recently to my uh, great pleasure been appointed to a, a chair in public health and planning at the University of the West of England and uh, uh, just in the same week as, as uh, the coalition has appointed a minister who doesn't believe in planning, who believes in chaos as a, a, as a way of moving society forward. What a, what a terrible indictment that planning has become such uh, an anathema uh, to, to the state. Such an anathema. A bit like strategy and policy. I, um, I, as, a, as a result of my um, uh, um, leaving the Department of Health, but more, more probably uh, the interview I gave with The Guardian, I, I uh, uh, was asked would I mind standing down as uh, joint chair of the government's sexual health advisory committee. Not unexpectedly, I thought, really. Um, but that's, that's been very interesting. Um, uh, experience over the last period since uh, 2010 because uh, there is in a, a thing uh, being developed uh, which we're not allowed to call a, a sexual health strategy or a sexual health policy and it sort of is known within the department as the sexual health thing. It might be a framework, it might be a guidance or something, but there is something amazing about a government that we put in charge of a country that refuses to talk about strategies, that refuses to talk about policies, that refuses to talk about planning. And health, I think, is a prime example of where that is going to be seen in the raw. Um, and let me start by repeating what Caroline said about uh, the illness surf service issue. And it is a really immense issue. Health is not solely determined by the NHS. And one of the key things that's driven my life, absolute professional life, absolutely, has been uh, trying to cope with some of the problems that are largely self-inflicted on us as a society. Uh, and they happen to be uh, often associated with diseases of excess, of excess consumption, uh, and of unhealthy, unsustainable systems that we put in place, whether that be for transport or whether it be for the production of the food that we eat. For example, the problem of obesity, a, 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 a huge problem for us now and particularly in the, in the future. And we know very well the size of that problem because we have all of the data from schools. We have a very good uh, measuring system of uh, heights and weights of children when they enter primary school and when they leave primary school. And the growth in obesity during that period is enormous during that period of only seven years in, in school. And we also have very good data, or, or had very good data, because one of the things that this government is, is systematically dismantling uh, are our information systems. We have very good data on uh, travel to school, how the children of this country in each and every school travelled to school, and it was part of a school census that was run regularly. But that, amongst many other things, has now been dropped by the coalition government. And what we do know for this city and for places all over the place, but particularly for this city and the data for this city, we know that 34% of primary school children in Bristol 
travel to school by car. 34%. That is outrageous. And of those 34%, 37% live within half a mile of the primary school to which they're going by car. Is it any wonder we have a problem with obesity? And is it any wonder, in the bit of Bristol I live in Hotwells, I'm right in the middle of a, um, uh, an air quality management zone. In fact, there's no management goes on of this zone and people don't know anything about it at all. But we've got serious air pollution problems. And simply because the days of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, smog have gone away doesn't mean that our air quality has no effect on our health. And the estimates are that poor air quality in this country uh, results in at least 3,000 premature deaths per annum. So how can we be dealing with uh, obesity when uh, the government doesn't seem to care at all about the issue of how children uh, move about in our communities? Neither indeed do they seem to care about what they're eating. And we've seen the uh, proposals from Michael Gove uh, to uh, end any requirement upon his new uh, brands of schools um, to adhere to any nutritional guidelines for what their children are fed in schools. This is outrageous when we know. We know the effect of nutrition on children, child development, on their intellectual development, um, and we know the detrimental effects. And we know on that, going right back to the Boer War, going right back to the Boer War, and that was the first time that we realized that feeding children and looking after children properly would have a huge effect upon their future physical uh, health. Um, we have a responsibility deal or a series of irresponsibility deals set up by the government where they're sitting around the table and deciding what should happen about things such as food or alcohol um, or physical activity with representatives of industry, without representatives of the, the major uh, community organisations and also based on a model that is totally centralist, that acknowledges the role of organisations uh, like Tesco in our lives, but refuses to um, recognize the role of the huge, rich variety of projects around food and sustainable agriculture that are going on, but are not part of a big multinational uh, corporation. It's a corporatist view of how the country should be run. Tobacco, we're sitting in a, a city famous for tobacco, famous for tobacco, and tobacco and, and slavery, what a, a proud basis for uh, <laughs> for the wealth of the city and you only have to walk up the Park Street and, and see the, the Wills building of the university and, and the Wills family donated huge amounts of money uh, to Bristol and did some good, uh, I must admit, despite all the, all, all the harm that, that, that has, been, has been done. But this city council, in its pension funds, and along with every other council in the southwest, has money invested in the tobacco industry. A hundred million pounds invested by the local authorities in the southwest region in the tobacco industry. What could that do if we could manage to liberate that money from those pension funds and have those pension funds invested in socially useful uh, uh, enterprise, in economic development uh, at a local level, that would generate a return, not only for the pensioners who rely upon the pension funds, but would deliver a return for the communities. Because there's precious little return of tobacco for tobacco in Bristol, despite the uh, six monthly, their most recent figures, I think, of, of uh, half a billion pounds worth of profits from Imperial Tobacco. Imperial Tobacco still global headquarters in, in Bristol global headquarters in Bristol but, uh, and earning vast amounts of money, but the only tobacco industry that still refuses to acknowledge that smoking causes cancer. They still refuse to that. And the uh, Bristol City Council, Council, I don't know if you visited M Shed on the, on the uh, harbour front, uh, grateful recipients of a quarter of a million pounds of largesse from Imperial Tobacco to build that. And this is, instrument, this is uh, I think, illustrative at a local level, how the same corporate influences are at play, just as they were during the Olympics with uh, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Cadbury's, and so on involved. And irrespective of whether it's the NHS, or either, irrespective of whether it's um, issues around what we, what we eat or what we drink or how we move around in our society, this government regards it all as a money-making opportunity. And it's almost as if if there isn't money to be made out of it, they're not interested. That is their definition of, of value. Um, and of course, the NHS is 
extraordinarily important. In this region, like any other region, the, the NHS accounts for 10% of GDP, a huge, a huge proportion of the economy of, of the country is represented in the NHS. And when we think of the NHS, we often think just of the hospitals and the doctors, nurses and the GPs and so on, but it's much, much more than that. It's all the suppliers, it's all the food that's uh, procured by the NHS, all the journeys that are being made uh, by people going to uh, hospitals or health centres for treatment, um, uh, or the staff travelling, uh, all of the, the, the construction and building that is, is taking place because it constantly needs to be renewed. All of that is extraordinarily important, and I think this government feels that there is money to be made out of that. So, a real theme, I think, of what the government is doing is opening up the NHS in particular to private enterprise, opening it up to uh, what they believe uh, will be or they sell it as an opportunity to bring in the skills of private enterprise into the NHS. And the nonsense of this is, when this government took over, uh, support amongst the public for the NHS and satisfaction with the NHS was at an all-time high. And the previous government did, uh, in its later years, invest very substantial amounts of uh, money in the NHS, and that delivered real benefit for patients and enabled the renewal of a huge amount of out-of-date infrastructure in the NHS. And all of this progress is in real danger of being swept away. Because the NHS changes are fundamentally centralising power over the NHS and authority over the NHS. And they are fundamentally undemocratic. In creating the, the uh, NHS commissioning board, led by Sir David Nicholson, what you are seeing is a very substantial proportion, maybe 50% of all of the NHS spend is going to be channeled via that organisation, uh, the NHS Commissioning Board, based in, in Leeds, accountable uh, to the Secretary of St uh, State, but basically able as a public body in its own right to uh, go its own way. And we look forward to seeing the mandate when it is announced, the mandate between uh, the Secretary of State and the NHS Commissioning Board, and there are already um, rumours of, of very serious disagreements about the content of that mandate, and it will be absolutely vital. So this organisation will control 50% of the spend. That's what the government aims for. Of course, the, uh, the story that is told is that uh, it'll be GPs will be in charge. We're putting GPs in charge. I'll let me tell you, I, I trained in general practice, and there was no part of my training in general practice that at any way equipped me or any other GP to run what is a multi-million pound public sector organisation. That's not what we were taught to do. It is a complete nonsense to think that either GPs are equipped uh, to perform that task or indeed that they want to perform that task. I've come across very few general practitioners who really want to do that. What they want to do and what they were trained to do is to help their patients and get the best for their patients. And they are deeply concerned about the intrusion of, uh, and the imposition of a responsibility on them. With every decision that they make about a patient, they have to think about the financial consequences of it, and perhaps even the financial consequences for their own practice and their own incomes. And that's an ethical dilemma that we should not be allowing to be placed on general practitioners because that will inevitably come between some general practitioners and doing what is best for their patients. And that is really, really a dangerous road to go down. But the, the uh, clinical commission groups within which general practitioners are to be organised, they will control the other 50% of the NHS spend. But how will it, that operate? For example, if you have a look at one of the, the big Bristol hospitals, they have patients from clinical commissioning groups right across the south, southwest and, and from Wales and so on. The NHS commissioning board, which will be controlling the other 50%, will have a predominant say in all of that. And the clinical commissioning groups are ultimately accountable to the NHS commissioning board. So instead of a system of primary care trusts where uh, there were independent uh, bodies, they were accountable bodies of course, but they were, uh, they were public sector bodies with a chair and a chief executive and people in the community knew who they were and there were people from the local communities on the boards and they met in public, we're going to have the NHS commissioning board, a distant organisation, supremely powerful in all of this. And absolutely nothing, and I think this is a characteristic of many of 
the changes that the government is making to the public sector, placing a huge amount of power in Whitehall and then expecting everyone else out there just to get on with it. And I have no doubt that there will be clinical commission groups that will take great advantage of the power they have been given and the money they have been given. There are some who will do a great job. That is right. And it is a bit like those communities that I was talking about uh, uh, earlier. Some places have the, uh, the resources, the, the, the social capital to be able to do that and others won't. So what I think we will see, we will see some great examples. And I forecast a raft of publication showing examples of good practice about how it can be done. How it can be done. But what we will see in terms of the normal distribution curve is that we will also see a lot of places failing. And those organisations failing mean patients being failed. And we will see a widening of the distribution curve, and I feel very sure that we are going to see uh, a slipping of the mean, that the overall level of provision, quality of provision of health care to the population of this country will be uh, uh, damaged, seriously damaged, and we will see some places doing very well and some places doing appallingly badly, and that will become manifest in the re-emergence of postcode lotteries about what treatments are available to whom where. Uh, and that is the situation I thought we had moved away from. I thought we had moved on from that and that we had reached a consensus that the NHS was the right way to perform things and that people, irrespective of what side of a road they, uh, they lived, had a, a right to the NHS uh, provision of, the, of effective care and treatment for them.